Good evening, everyone. Certainly it's good to see you here tonight for our evening uh, worship service. I want to remind you that uh, tonight after services, uh, obviously you see the tables out there, we're going to have some uh, finger foods, and we'll also be um, talking about lads to leaders. In fact, after the invitation is extended, I'll get back up here, and if you would be seated, please. Um, we'll have about uh, 10 minutes or less of some slides, about three or four slides that I'll go through that kind of breaks down some of the things that you can participate in. And then we'll have our meal, and then Casey and I will be in the classroom right off of the uh, uh, foyer, and we'll have all the sign-up sheets. And again, I'll say more about that um, during our, uh, after, the, uh, after the lesson concludes this evening. I always think it's funny to hear finger foods because when I was in college, I actually preached for the Finger Church of Christ. So we would actually, anytime we had a meal, it was called finger foods. So anyhow, tonight, uh, if you have your Bibles, you, you might want to open them up to uh, the Old Testament, uh, Jeremiah 37 and 38. We're going to take a look there uh, tonight. You know, most uh, Bible students are familiar with the uh, New Testament narrative surrounding the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Most of us are familiar with that uh, with that story. However, unknown to some and forgotten by others is another Ethiopian eunuch named Ebed Melech. And so tonight we're going to talk about Ebed Melech. So before we get into him in particular, let's talk about the historical background of the text. So if you if you look there in in Jeremiah really chapter 37, 38, and 39, Babylon uh, was besieging the city of Jerusalem. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel had long been taken into Assyrian captivity. They were really kind of out of the picture. All that was left was Judah. And Jehoiachin had been the last king of the southern kingdom of Judah, and he reigned for about three months, and then Babylon was coming upon the people of Judah. They put in Zedekiah as king, and we'll talk about him in, in just a moment. So they're besieging the city again, but Babylon received news that Egypt was coming up from the south to help Jerusalem. And so they temporarily lifted their siege upon the city because they knew that the Egyptians were coming up. It was during this time that Jeremiah prophesied that Babylon would return and destroy Jerusalem. So just kind of picture this for a moment. Everybody got kind of excited because the uh, Egyptians were coming to help. That had caused the Babylonians to kind of go away for a little bit. And everybody thought all was good. But Jeremiah, being the man of God, and simply being a messenger of God, clearly indicated, you know, they're coming back. And not only are they coming back, they will destroy our city. For saying that, Jeremiah was arrested. And this man of God was charged with being a traitor by his own people. Chapter 37, verses 11 through 16. So let me give you a little bit of detail here. During this interlude in the siege, Jeremiah did attempt to leave the city of Jerusalem. And he might have left to visit his hometown of Anathoth. That's very possible. But when he tried to leave, he was accused of intending to desert to the Babylonians. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. He was put in the house of Jonathan, who was a scribe or a secretary. And his house had actually been converted into some sort of, uh, really some sort of subterranean dungeon. And that's where he was being kept prisoner. It was probably a deep basement cavern with cells and niches carved into the walls. Some have suggested that these cells force the prisoner to sit or lie in a cramped position. And Jeremiah was there for a considerable amount of time. And he wasn't, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years of age. He was 60 years old. And so we've got this 60-year-old man, a man of God, 
who's in this subterranean prison, which formerly was the house of Jonathan, the secretary, and he's all cramped up and he's contortioned up inside this, this dungeon. But at the instigation of the king, he was removed to more comfortable quarters in the police guardhouse. And upon such occasions, as the king asked for his advice, Jeremiah advised that the case was hopeless. Zedekiah, the king, would be handed over to the Babylonians. So every once in a while, Zedekiah would say, you know, let's, let's, let's bring old Jeremiah out of, out of prison, out of the guardhouse. Let me hear if he's changed his story. And every time, every time he was brought up, um, Jeremiah made very clear, you know, this city is going to be destroyed and you're going to be handed over to the Babylonians. During his confinement, Jeremiah had some opportunity to continue proclaiming his message to the people. And while he was in confinement, he said the same thing he was saying to Zedekiah. And some of the people were livid that he was making these kinds of comments. They wanted a cheerleader who was going to tell them everything was going to turn out all right. But again, he stuck to his guns and clearly indicated what God was telling him to prophesy. As a result of what he was saying, the officials urged Zedekiah to have Jeremiah put to death. They argued that he was demoralizing the few fighting men that remained, as well as the people. And so this very pathetically weak king capitulated. Look, if you will, at chapter 38 and verse 5. So King Zedekiah said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. That's one of those things that politicians and kings do. It's sort of plausible deniability, right? They basically just say, you know, do what you want, don't tell me about it here in the text. So Jeremiah was taken and was put into a pit, almost certainly a cistern that was in a courtyard. And again, remember, he's 60 years of age. And so they let him down by ropes into this cistern, which was an underground tank used to collect rainwater. There was no water in this cistern, but there was mud in the cistern, which he sank into. In fact, Josephus, who didn't live at this time, but who later would write about this incident, said about Jeremiah, he stood up to his neck in the mire. So he was in there really, really deep. And, and think about this. It was dark. It was damp. It was full of mud. There would have been all kinds of rodents in there. And here he is, a 60-year-old man, up to his neck. He couldn't last long in this state of confinement. His enemies thought that they had buried their problem. But this is when we're introduced to a character named Ebed-Melech who comes to Jeremiah's defense in chapter 38, verses 8 through 13. I really think this is one of the unsung heroes of the Bible. I mean, we often talk about who we'd like to see in heaven. You know, we talk about, I'd like to see Jeremiah in heaven, and I'd like to see John the Revelator in heaven. I'd like to see Paul in heaven. Add to your list... Add to your list Ebed-Melech as someone that you want to see when you get to heaven. He was a dark-skinned eunuch of Ethiopia, which was south of Egypt, which would have included portions of modern-day Ethiopia and Sudan. And he was one of Zedekiah's palace servants. No doubt, you know, at one point he was taken into captivity and he served at the pleasure of the king. Now, he was a eunuch. Eunuch can be a technical term for a palace official, but as some commentators have argued, here it may designate someone who is actually emasculated. When he learned of Jeremiah's fate, he approached the king. And look at verse 9 of chapter 38. My lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet whom they have cast into the cistern, 
and he will die right where he is because of the famine, for there is no more bread in the city. Now think about this. This was a time of war. This was a low-level type of servant. He approaches the king because he's concerned about what's happened to Jeremiah, even though the king was involved in what had happened to Jeremiah. And he talks about the famine in the land. If you go over a few chapters in Jeremiah, you will see that things are desperate. And they're only going to get more desperate. They get so bad that the people of Judah start to eat their young. So I've never, I've been hungry, you know. I've not been that hungry, you know. But we're talking about being so hungry that people were eating their young. That's how desperate the times were. And you would think during a time like this, this is the last thing that someone would be willing to kind of go out on a ledge, right? And go out and say something to the king. But that's exactly what we see here with ebed Melech. He was brave enough to indict the rogues who had put Jeremiah into the cistern, but he was diplomatic enough not to implicate the king directly. So he was pretty suave here, wasn't he, and how he, how he, pretty smooth in how he approached the king. He calls him a prophet, Jeremiah. He says that it was evil to place him there. That's a strong word, isn't it? It was evil to place him there. And he argues that if you keep Jeremiah there, he's as good as dead. And so he pled for his life. What hard times these were. The only one with enough courage to rescue God's spokesman was a foreigner. There was no one in the land of Judah who was willing to speak up. We're the priests, right? We're the godly people of the day. They're not there. So it takes a foreign person to make the case on behalf of Jeremiah. And as you know, I think that this really is the providence of God. Centuries later, the favor would be returned to Ethiopia by another eunuch in Acts chapter 8. The king was touched by ebed Melech and him approaching him. And so 30 men were commissioned to recover Jeremiah before he died. And let's look at the text, verses 11 through 13 of chapter 38. So ebed Melech took the men under his authority and went into the king's palace to a place beneath the storeroom and took from there worn-out cloths and worn-out rags and let them down by ropes into the cistern to Jeremiah. Then ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, said to Jeremiah, Now put these worn-out clothes and rags under your armpits, under the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. So they pulled Jeremiah up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern, and Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse. And so... These, these clothes, these rags, they were really kind of like protection, weren't they, for his armpits as they took a robe and they tried to pull him out of the cistern. If he was really stuck in that mud, if it had hardened and you're 60 years old and you're trying to pull someone up by their underarms, this is going to be kind of painful, isn't it? And so these 30 men together work to pull him out. Now, Jeremiah didn't have freedom after this, he was rehoused in the court of the guard, but he was able to still have some freedom to preach to the people of that day. And eventually, when the city was overtaken, Nebuchadnezzar recognized the importance of Jeremiah and was able to set him free, which is sort of ironic, right? His own brethren had imprisoned him, but a foreign king, Nebuchadnezzar, allowed him to go free because he realized the quality of the character of Jeremiah. For his deed, Ebed-Melech was promised survival of the calamity that would come upon Jerusalem. Look at chapter 39, verses 15 through 18. Now the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah. 
while he was confined in the court of the guardhouse, saying, Go and speak to ebed Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I'm about to bring my words on this city for disaster and not for prosperity, and they will take place before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that day, declares the Lord, and you shall not be given to the hands of the men whom you dread. For I will certainly rescue you, ebed Melech, and you will not fall by the sword, but you will have your own life as booty because you have trusted in me, declares the Lord. So what are some, some practical lessons from, from this narrative in the Old Testament? Here's the first thing, and it, it takes me back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Here's a man in an uncertain time. Do we live in an uncertain time today? We definitely do, don't we? Here's a man who lived in an uncertain time who knew what was right and he knew what was wrong. He knew what was evil and he knew what was wicked. And he wasn't afraid to call it by name. Look at Isaiah 5 and verse 20. Notice the text there. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I remember when I was in college at Fried Hardeman, uh, the, the preacher at the college church there on a, on a Wednesday night, he brought in a, a sack and it had an onion in it. We all know how onions smell. And he pulled out the onion and he said, this isn't an onion, this is a rose. But isn't that the, isn't that the day in which we live? That an onion is a rose? We know in our culture that everybody says it's okay to be gay, right? But the Bible says it's an abomination. We know in our culture today people say it's just a choice. You have a choice. But the Bible says that it's innocent life. We know that the world says evolution is a scientific fact, but it's really a rejection of God. We know that many people say it's Christian liberty to do whatever you want to when it comes to salvation, when it comes to worship, but the Bible calls it false doctrine. And so we have to be clear in an unstable age that there are certain things that are right and there are certain things that are wrong. The second thing about ebed Malek, he had concern for another in the midst of his own personal troubles. I mean, think about it. You know, here's a time when the government's very unstable. He was probably a little unsure of his own position. He's a foreigner living in a foreign land. And yet, you know, could he have kind of put this on the back burner? Do you think he probably maybe had other things he was more concerned about? But he took up the cause of Jeremiah. He was a different nationality. He had a different skin color. He was a servant of the king and yet he spoke up. Jesus would later say in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40, that the greatest commandment is that we truly show love one for another. And definitely, ebed Malek was able to, to do that. And then also, finally, his concern led him to action. You know, I think there's a lot of folks today, and I think you'd agree, there are a lot of people who say, you know, I'm really concerned about that. But that's it. They don't do anything about it, right? I, I'm really concerned about our country. I'm really concerned about the church or whatever it is. But they don't do anything about it. It's like those people who say, well, I'm concerned about the direction of our, company, or of our country, but they don't vote and they don't pray about it, right? If we're really concerned about it, we should do something about it. Notice what James says over in the New Testament. James 2, 14 through 17. What use is it, my brethren... If a man says he has faith, but he has no works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give him what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, it is dead, being by itself. And so if we're not careful... 
We can do just the opposite of Ebed Melech and say, you know, really not my concern, really not my problem, you know. But that's not the position that Ebed Melech took. And ultimately, I'm sure he, that wasn't his motive, but at the end of the day, it was his, it was his benefit, wasn't it? That he was faithful to God and he, he stood up. You know, as, we, as we bring these thoughts to, to closure tonight, just as in the days of Jeremiah, God needs people who are full of courage and compassion. Would you have stood up for Jeremiah if you were one of his contemporaries? And the question is, will you take a stand for Jesus? I can't let this pass by. Ebed Melech. Ebed means servant. And Melech means king. It is not an African name, as you would expect someone to have who came from Ethiopia. His name means servant of the king or servant king. Who does that remind you of? Jesus Christ. And you and I, because of our sins, aren't we in a pit? Aren't we in a cistern? Aren't we in a mess? And here's the thing. Christ didn't just lower the rope. He himself took on that shame, took on that guilt for us. But because of what he did, we're able to climb up out of that pit. And so I'm so grateful for Ebed Melech. And I hope that all of us get to see him one day in heaven. Tonight, if you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to do that, to believe in Christ, to repent of your sins, to acknowledge Him, to confess Him as Lord and Savior, and to be immersed in water, to have your sins washed away. That's the first step on your journey to heaven, so that one day we all can be together there with Jesus, with God, with the Holy Spirit, and with these great people of old. Perhaps you are a Christian. That's good. But as you look at your life, it's maybe not where you'd like it to be. If we can pray with you or for you in any way, won't you? Please come forward. While together we stand and sing to encourage you. I have things, and I'm going to turn over to Tom here so we can close this out in a word of prayer. I want to talk about Lads to Leaders, which we're kicking off tonight. Uh, Lads to Leaders has a big convention every year, but you don't have to go to the convention, but it is part of Lads to Leaders. Not everybody goes to it, but some do. The convention for next year is March 25th through 27th. It's always Easter weekend, and the reason it's Easter weekend is because ho hotels are cheap um, that uh, weekend because no one wants a convention on Easter weekend. That's, that's the honest truth why they always have it on Easter weekend. And on Easter weekend, there'll be a convention in Louisville. There'll be one in Orlando. There'll be one in Memphis. There'll be one in Atlanta. And there'll be one in Nashville and also one in Dallas. And there'll be about 20,000 young people at all those conventions. The biggest one that I know Casey and I have been to the one in Louisville and the one in Nashville. The one in Nashville has about 10,000 young people from Churches of Christ there. And the one in Louisville has about 2,500. And so you'll hear more about that. So kind of mark that date on your calendar. Okay, let's go to the next slide. The neat thing about Lads to Leaders is that it's not just for kids. It's for adults. It's for the entire family. And so there's actually, and not everything involves having to go to the convention, as I mentioned. So the adult categories, and we'll have sign-up sheets for those as well, some of these are real simple. And you actually get a certificate for this, and we kind of uh, announce everybody who participates. So if you're an adult, 
but between now and I think it's December, all, a lot of this has to be done, some of it's by convention time, if you can recite the books of the Old Testament, right? A lot of people can do that, right? If you can recite the books of the New Testament, okay? Or if you can recite both, all right? That, that's, that's something that we give out a certificate for. And then a higher level is not only can you recite every book of the Bible, but you can tell the theme of every book, okay? And so that's one competition for the adults. Now, there are lots of competitions. This first time, we've kind of narrowed it down to just a few so that we don't kind of overwhelm us the first time. The next one is read the Word. I know a lot of folks, in, you have to, in a 12-month span, you have to read either the Old Testament or the New Testament or both. And if you do that, you get a, you get a certificate for doing that, and you're, you're honored at the convention. Or if you don't go to the convention, you're still honored. So I know a lot of you are on track to already do that. That's a, that's a no-brainer, right? So we'll have a, have a sign-up sheet for that. Good Samaritan involves doing good deeds, like taking food to someone who is shut in or visiting someone who's in the hospital. And you just kind of keep track of that, and, and, and there's a way to honor people for doing that. And then finally, there's Centurion of Scripture for adults. You can eat.